Someone once said, I thought this is a beautiful quote, Easter is the soul's first taste of winter. Did winter seem too long this year? And you notice how winter can be dreary and gray and oppressive and it's cold and it stings. You know, somebody on Facebook said, I live in a place where the air hurts my face. Why do I live in a place where the air hurts my face? I live in a world that hurts my soul. It stings. It's cold. It's lonely sometimes. You don't know if people understand. Then you look at yourself and you're not thinking about other people and you're not understanding. And there's disappointment in our government, maybe disappointment in our family. And we look at ourselves and we're disappointed in ourselves. Why are we so, what, why are we such a piece of work? Why are we so messed up? Why so much drama? Why so much pouting? Why so much selfishness? Why, do we, why are we so good at feeling sorry for ourselves and, and dwelling on a slight, somebody didn't treat me right? Why are we so good at those things? Things that you don't need the Holy Spirit for, right? The whole world knows how to do those things. And then, I remember that Jesus Christ died to take care of all my sin. You know, I believe that. He didn't take care of my, just, just the, the nice, pleasant sins. Oh, that was a white lie. He died for everything. The times that you used language. We, God gives us this gift of language. Why? So we can praise him. So we can bring glory to him. So that we can love other people. And, and what do we use this voice for? To rip apart people that we're supposed to be loving most. What do you use this voice for? To, we're joking around about things we shouldn't be joking around, saying things we should not be saying, just messing people over. God gave me this voice to praise him. And in that winter, when I think about that cross, and I think about the fact that God in flesh didn't stay dead, did not stay in that tomb. He rose up. He, he broke the chains. He kicked in the jail cells. He said, I'm getting out of here, and you can come with me, and you, and you, and you. And he pointed at all of us. And you step out of that gloom and the dreariness and the darkness and the oppression and all the brokenness and all the disappointment in the world and in ourselves, and there is springtime for the soul, and all the snow is melting, the sun is shining, and it's new life. It's really... New life in Jesus Christ. I need that. I'm weary to the bone sometime. There's a weariness, a cynicism, a meanness, a darkness, a brokenness in this world. You know it. Be honest, you see it in yourself. I need this springtime. I need goodness. I need truth. I need the resurrection of life. I need somebody who sees me as I am and still loves me enough to die for me. I need somebody who sees me as I am and won't get tired of me, that won't dismiss me, that won't run away from me. I need somebody who knows everything and wraps his arms around me and says, I'd do anything for you. I'd even die for you. And then when I grab a hold of that hammer and that nail, and I hammer him to that cross because my sin put him on that cross. My sin. Don't blame the Jews. Don't blame the Romans. It's our sin that put him there. And I'm hammering to that cross, and he looks at me and says, I love you. And then when, three days later, he comes back to life and says, and I'm taking you with me. And I'm going to say, I'll surrender to that. I'll, why, why would I fate, fight love like that? I'll surrender to that. There's a lot of things in this world I'm not going to surrender to. I'm not going to bow to. I'm going to bow to a Savior that would die for me. About 150 students were killed at a university in Kenya just this week. 150. Terrorists went through to try to separate who they thought was Muslim, who they thought was Christian. They said, we're here to, we're here to kill and be killed. Wiping out people, shooting them, gunning them down, corridors filled with bodies. And not only were they killing 
eyewitnesses they were says they were laughing and they were mocking Christian students saying that we're here to make this a great Easter for you. Well, those fools were prophesying. Those fools were prophesying. They made it a great Easter because each person who put their faith in Jesus Christ and was shot down and gunned down <laughs> to celebrate the, the most wonderful Easter possibly all they did was bring him right into the presence of the one who loves them most. The one who's had victory over, the de over death, victory over the grave. Easter, okay, let me do some house cleaning first. Some people, some Christians, and some non-Christians think that the word Easter is a joke because it was an old pagan goddess named Easter, and so we shouldn't use the word Easter Okay, I will capitulate. Instead, we're going to call it Rutherford. Rutherford Day. Now, you say, well, what is Rutherford Day? Well, that's the point, isn't it? Rutherford is going to stand for the day we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is it okay if I use the word Easter? All it is is a term, and it's representing the day when we remember that Jesus got up out of that grave. And if you'd rather call it Rutherford, go ahead, but we all know what you're talking about, and you know what I'm talking about when I say Easter, Quit being a drama queen. <laughs> Seriously, we don't have to make issues out of these things. Easter is the story, the true story of Jesus dying for me. He said, I'm going to take your place. Well, who's messed up? Who needs somebody to come and save them? Who's drowning? Jesus' story of Jesus dying and then powerfully raising back to life. And listen to this. He did all this to save his enemies. And Jesus saw people shaking their fist at heaven saying, God, how dare you? Shaking their fist at God saying, I will not bend my knee. Shaking their fist at God saying, you can't tell me what to do. And Jesus said, I'm going to win you with love. And I'm hanging on this tree because I love you. And that sin that you won't confess, I'm going to die for it. And listen I will wrap my arms around you, and I'm going to take you with me to paradise. Surrender. Quit fighting me. Quit fighting this love. Good Friday, Easter, is God going to agonizing lengths in order to bring love to those that want to fight him. Jesus won his enemies with love. Jesus went to the cross to save the people that want to knock his jaw out of, out of joint. Jesus died and rose again so that the people who want to spit on him can be his family. Now, brothers and sisters, you call yourself a Christian? Then we better start loving people who don't like us. Better start loving people who say we're old-fashioned, out of date. Better start loving people who don't have the time of day for us, who think we're all hypocrites who think we're all self-righteous and judgmental, you better start loving those folks. Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. And if we get together as a church and we sit around talking about how good we are, we are and how bad those people out there are, we are missing the point of the cross. None of us are good enough to stand with Jesus. All of us need this grace. Brothers and sisters, there's no place for pride in the church of God. We get to Jesus on our knees. Let's love other people and win them instead of looking down at them. Okay? Okay? Yeah. We can do better than that. Amen? Yeah. yeah, amen. And here's the thing. Here's the thing to everybody listening. You won't appreciate Good Friday. You have no appreciation for Easter unless you know your brokenness. Let me say that again. You're never going to appreciate Easter. You are never going to understand how good Good Friday is until you know you are a broken wretch. Oh, wretched man that I am. You will never be filled with gratitude and say, thank you, Jesus. You're going to forgive me all of this? If you are so good at defending every nasty attitude, thought, and deed in your life, 
Quit defending yourself to God. Who do you think you're fooling anyways? Who do you think you're fooling? Amen. That's right, yourself. If we're going to really appreciate Jesus, we better know that we were drowning in that water and he jumped in to save us. Because if you think you're just suntanning on the beach when you're actually drowning in shark-infested water, you're not going to be happy when somebody comes up to try and save you. Because you fool yourself. Remember what we said about the Holy Spirit? He can't go. He can't fill you up if you're already full of yourself. Confess your sins. Come clean. Grace is waiting. Love is waiting. There's no reason to push back on Jesus. There's no reason to send away this kind of love. The more we understand how morally and spiritually bankrupt we are, wretched, how wretched we are, you know what? It's going to be easy to cling to Jesus. Just cling. Just hold on for dear life. Just hold on to Jesus and say, you're my only hope. I don't find hope in here. Do you find hope in, in your own soul? You're kidding yourself. And I don't find hope when I turn on the evening news. I don't find hope when I hear the gossip at school or at work. I need something real. I need real hope, something bigger and better than me. The vision of the cross or the empty tomb won't, stole, won't, won't stir the soul of a person enthralled with their own reflection. The vision of that empty tomb, the vision of your Savior hanging on the cross is not going to stir your soul if all you can see is a vision of yourself. I choose what's right and wrong for myself. I decide what's moral for myself. I decide, I decide, I decide. Oh, good. You're good at looking at yourself. Actually, you're not. Take a good look at yourself, and you will come running to Jesus. In other words, if all I can see, if all we can see is this vision of ourselves is how brilliant we think we are, how talented we think we are, how wonderful. I am such a wonderful person. You know, good without God. Look at how good I am at patting myself on the back because I don't know myself. You ain't good. How wise we think we are. If all we're f uh, filled up with is all these things is things we think about ourselves, we will never, we will never, we will never, ever, ever find ourselves thrilled at the idea of a perfect God who saw us as we are and still loved us anyways. God would live me, a sinner, ruined and broken by the fall. Brothers and sisters, friends, Good Friday means you can come clean. See, if, all, if we have a religion where, where we're always afraid of God, he's going to judge us, and, and I have this cosmic scale, and my good deeds are over, my, over here, my bad deeds are over here, I'm always going to be afraid. Do I measure up? Do I measure up? But the Bible says love casts out fear. We don't follow God out of fear. Now, we might come to him because we're afraid. We don't follow God out of fear. We follow him out of love because what he's done for us. Good Friday means you can come clean. I don't have to defend the garbage. I don't have to defend all those bad attitudes. I don't have to defend the way I treated my spouse. I don't have to defend. I can say, wait a second, I was out of line, and it feels so good to admit that. I'm wrong, God. You're right. Good Friday means Jesus already took care of it all. You don't have to defend it. He took care of it all. Therefore, we can be honest and say, I'm broken. He loves me anyways, and I'm broken, and you're broken. I'm going to try to love you anyways because of Good Friday. No need to pretend. Isn't that nice? Don't you want to just come out in the fresh air and say, I don't have to put on a religious mask anymore. I don't have to pretend I'm something I'm not anymore. I can come clean. I can breathe this fresh air of forgiveness. I am forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and I don't have to be some false-faced person trying to be what I'm not anymore. I confess my sins. I need that Savior. And I believe God loves me so much. Look what he did for me. Ruined and broken, he says, I'll make you whole again. In resurrection, res Sunday, you know what that means? God keeps his promises. He said he's coming back, right? And he came back. He got up right out of that grave. And if he says, I can forgive you, and then he can get up out of that grave, well, I, I heard somebody say, you know, usually you don't have a, the end of your life unless you have the beginning of your life, right? 
In the context of, of Easter, we wouldn't celebrate Christmas if we didn't have Easter. We celebrate Christmas because at Easter, Jesus got up out of the uh, rose up from the dead, proving he can do something about our sins. He defeated sin. He defeated death. And that's why we celebrate, celebrate Christmas, because that's why he came. He came to die for us. He came to rise, raise up to new life, showing that God keeps his promises. So here's how we live a Christian life. Okay, you ready? Spiritual breathing. You exhale. You just confess all your sins. Lord, I had this wrong. I had this wrong. I had this wrong. God, your ways are better than my ways. I admit that. And I want to live your way. I'm sick and tired of my way. Lord, I exhale. And then what do you inhale? How about all that love? How about all that grace? How about all that acceptance? And God does not look at you with a stink face. God does not look at you like he can't stand you. God does not look at you like I'm so tired of you. God looks at you and says, I died for you, I love you, you are mine, and I'm not letting you go. Jesus said, all the Father has given me, not one will slip out of my hand. God celebrates you. You're his child, and he loves you. Truth can't be kept underground. Love is stronger than the grave. Goodness cannot, will not be defeated. Life is greater than death. Life has the last word, not death. And the author of life snatches victory from death itself, kicking down those jail cells, saying, get out of there. You weren't meant to live in there. Follow me. As we, we're about to read through the Easter story now, and we're just going to take some time and just go through what the Bible says here. Just read it verse by verse. I want you to ask yourself, does this have anything to do with me? Last week, remember, Jesus Christ's birth changed the world. But I said, ask yourself, it changed the world, but has it really changed you? Does it matter that he was born in this world? This week, does the fact that Jesus didn't stay buried, does that change anything for you? Is your life different because you've embraced that truth? Turn with me now to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Okay, Luke chapter 23, we're going to read from verse 33. This is the reading of the word of God. Let's just go through it together. Twenty-three from verse thirty-three. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on the right side and one on the left. Jesus said, Father, as he's hanging from this cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was, there was a written notice above his head which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped, stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, the Roman soldier, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what had took place, they beat their breasts and they went away. But those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, 
who had not consented to the decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pontius Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut into the stone, one in which no one had ever been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb where his body was laid in. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men clothed uh, two men in, in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? You know, God invented cool. He is not here. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told these things to the eleven, the eleven disciples, to all others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others who told them this to the, told this to the apostles. But the apostles, the mighty men of God that were with Jesus for, all, for these last few years, says, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering himself what had happened. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. By the way, I never liked this story before. Uh... I've told you that a few times. I didn't like the Gospels. I didn't like Psalms. I know I was a pastor. I was a missionary. I was wrong. And I didn't like this story because they don't recognize Jesus. And I thought, oh, that's kind of, how could Jesus raise from the dead and they don't even recognize him? So, yeah, I was in Scripture. I believed it, but I didn't like it. But now it's more sweet to me. And I, and I think I'm really understanding there's a beauty here. They didn't see. They didn't understand. And when they do, when their eyes opened up, everything changed for them. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, but not everybody sees and not everybody knows. Look at from verse 14. These two fellows, these fellows in, uh, from this village seven miles from Jerusalem, Aramaeus, uh, uh, they were talking with each other about everything that happened. A lot had happened in Jerusalem. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself come up and walked along with them. They probably just looked over and said, hey, when did you get here? And maybe he smiled at them. I don't know. Would you like to know? But they, kept, uh, they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, Why are you discussing together? Uh, what are you discussing together? What are you talking about? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem, and you do not know these things that have happened in these days? And he said, Tell me, what things? <laughs> Jesus is drawing these guys out. This is wonderful. <coughs> About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. They're talking about saving Israel from Rome. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning. They didn't find his body they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women have said, but they didn't see him. Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, all that was said of him in the scriptures concerning himself. As they were approaching the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. 
So he went in and stay with them. When they were at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him. This is Jesus at the Last Supper, right? This is the image of Jesus breaking the bread, which is a symbol of his life. It's broken for you so that you could have eternal life. Bread gives us life. The bread of God, the bread of life, gives us eternal life. And so he's sitting there, and when he breaks the bread, then their eyes open and they understand. They recognize him, and he disappeared from their sight. Then they asked each other, weren't our hearts burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road? And when he was opening up the scriptures to us, and everybody who's met Jesus knows this feeling when your heart's just burning within you because Jesus is so good, and it's so good to be with him. It's so good to hear this truth. They got up, and they returned at once to Jerusalem, so they didn't want to travel at night. Now they're running. They're traveling at night. They returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11, and those with that were with him, assembled together and saying, It is true. The Lord is risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told everything that happened to them on the way and how Jesus had recognized uh, by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace, brothers. Uh, peace be with you. Isn't that a great thing? God is not up there saying, I'm just looking for an excuse to grind you into the ground. I'm looking for an excuse to kick you out of my family. I'm looking. This is God. Why did Jesus come to bring peace? And Jesus says, Peace be with you. Be with you. God wants to bring peace to us, peace in our relationship with him, peace in our lives, peace with one another through Jesus Christ. Do you have peace in your life? Get closer to Jesus. Don't you need this peace? Don't you yearn for this peace? Aren't you always tired of fighting with God, with yourself, with other people? Jesus came to bring peace. Well, they were startled and frightened thinking that they had seen a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why did doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When they had said this, they showed him his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he said to them, Hey, you guys got anything to eat? It's so beautiful. They're, st they're stunned here. They're, they can't even believe. What, what? We saw you die on the cross. What? We saw you wrapped up and buried in a tomb. You're here? And their minds, it does, you know, does not compute. Their brains are being fried. And Jesus says, do you have anything here to eat? I like this picture of Jesus coming and sitting with us, knocking at the door of our lives, saying, let me in, and I will dine with you, and you will dine with me. I like this picture of Jesus, uh, probably Jesus, uh, pre-incarnate, uh, in, the, in the garden with Adam and Eve, walking in the cool of the day. I like this idea that God wants to bring us into relationship with him, and he wants to eat with us, and he wants to sit with us, and he wants to walk with us, and he wants to talk with us, and he says, come on in, let me into your life, and we're going to do it together. We're going to do life together. We're going to go on this journey together. So he says, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it, because, he, you know, I've been dead. That was hard work. Ooh, this is good. You try being dead for a while, you're going to love this fish. He said to them, I'm reading in a little bit, but I think it's there. I think it's all there. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled as is written about me. And he's talking about the Old Testament, right? And the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened up their minds so they could understand the Old Testament, the Scriptures. He told them, this is what was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And when this was written, he only had a handful of followers. When this was written... There were, uh, the, most of the believers were still Jewish. When this was written, there weren't that many churches, and most of them were scattered around the Mediterranean, right? And Jesus gives this bold promise. He says, this is going to be preached in all nations. Guess what? In my lifetime, there's now a church in every nation on the planet. We've seen the fulfillment of this prophecy. Now it's still going out. It's still going out. Jesus said, my truth. The truth about my cross, the truth about me, the truth that God loves you and forgives you, 
This will be taught all over the world. And it is today. And brothers and sisters, we're just a small, aren't you so glad we're just a small church? A small part of what God's doing all around the world. This is not it. Look at what God's doing in all these churches around Janesville. Look at what God's doing in all these churches around Wisconsin. All over America, people are going to church this morning. All over North America and South America and all the praises of, uh, in Spanish rising up from South America and, and over to Asia and the thunderous praise of, of Korean Christians and the, and the small churches in Japan where there's a small minority. Maybe there's only 15 or 20 people in the church, but they're praying and celebrating the resurrection. <coughs> in China, where there's probably as many Christians in China as there are in the United States today. All over India, where there's this great revival going, going on in, in Northeast India. All over the world, in Africa, through Europe, Jesus Christ said this message of forgiveness is going to go everywhere, and it has. And all those people I just mentioned, well, they're your sisters, they're your brothers, and you're going to be with them in eternity. You'll know every single one of their names, given time. It's our family. And we want to bring more people into the family. And Jesus wants us to go out. Why do we go out and preach? So we can bring more people into the family. Grow this. This is a crusade of love. This is a mission of grace. We're going to win people, not with swords, not by punching them in the face. We're going to win people by bringing the cross of Jesus Christ, saying, repent of your sins, and you can have eternal life. Repent, confess your sins, come clean. Jesus loves you. He'll welcome you into the family. And Jesus said, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you. Uh, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That power, again, is the Holy Spirit. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Would have liked to have been there for that. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into the heavens. Then they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with what? Great, great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, which was they didn't have churches yet. Continually at the temple, praising God. Have you met Jesus Christ? And let's, let's celebrate. Do you know Jesus died for your sin? Doesn't that bring you joy? Don't, don't you believe that Jesus rose from that dead grave and he says, and all, everyone who is dead in their sins can raise to new life and you will have eternal life with me and peace and salvation belongs to me and I'll give it to freely anybody who comes to me and we will say, I want to be at church and I want to be with God's people and I'm going to be praising God continually and I have no more time to waste on holding a grudge. <coughs> I have no more time to waste on being bitter. I have no more time to waste filling up my my mouth with bitterness and cursing and anger because I want to praise God and I want to love people and I want to bring people into this family. Jesus, when they didn't know Jesus, their mind was covered. Then they met Jesus and their hearts burned within them and they saw Jesus as he truly was. And when they saw Jesus and they got this mission from Jesus, they worshipped him all the time. They were filled with joy and they were praising God. And anybody who's encountered the living God, we need to say no to our flesh, no to our self, no to our self-righteousness, and yes to him. Jesus, brothers and sisters, Jesus ain't for perfect people. Good without God, good all by myself, happy with yourself just as you are, make excuses for every sin. Jesus is not for you, and you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it because you're worshiping yourself. What a lousy idol to worship. I'd be miserable and pathetic to, to do that to myself. The people who are full of themselves are in the category of people that are going to miss out. There's only one perfect person. That was Jesus Christ. God came down in flesh. Jesus came, listen, he came for hurting people. Jesus came for lonely people. people came, Jesus came for people that are full of themselves, arrogant, full of pride. Jesus loves the people who look down at other people. He loves them so much he doesn't want them to do that anymore. Jesus came for people filled up with hatred, and they can't even stand themselves because every day they just think about this anger and something that was done to them, and they can't forgive it, and they can't let it go. 
and they're just burning, they're seething, and it eats up all their joy, it eats up all their days, and their, their soul is wrinkled and withered. And Jesus came for that person. The greedy person who takes advantage of people who are economically worse off than he is, and he uses them and takes advantage of them, Jesus still looks at them and says, I love you. Come to me, confess your sins, and get your life right. I'll teach you the joy of giving. Jesus came for self-righteous people, and I, for one, am very glad he did. Well, who's self-righteous? Our world will tell you self-righteous is Christians. They're so self-righteous. A person who knows they need Jesus and got down on their knees is saying, I have no righteousness in myself. I need you, Jesus. A person who's saying, I don't need God because I'm right all by myself. That is self-righteousness. You are not all right all by yourself. I am not right all by myself. Jesus Christ does not wink at sin. God condemns all sin because he's holy and perfect and heaven's perfect. If heaven was filled with sin, guess what it'd be like? Janesville, Milton, Beloit. In other words, not heaven. Although James and Floyd and Milton are pretty nice places. Jesus came for hurting people, lonely people, messed up people. Jesus came for addicts. I'm, I'm struggling with this addiction. I can't go to church. I'm struggling with this addiction. God can't love me. Don't. Do you really think that your sin is bigger than God's love? Now that's pride. Your sin is not bigger than God's grace. On the cross, Jesus took all the sins, and you ain't a worse sinner than anybody else. He took care of that too. Jesus Christ loves manipulators. He loves them so much he doesn't want them to be manipulators anymore. He doesn't want them to be liars anymore. He doesn't want them to find ways of using people for his own advantage. Jesus Christ loves manipulators. He loves them so much he says, get out, get done with that. That's no way to live, and that's no way to treat people that I love. Jesus Christ loves predators. Jesus Christ loves cruel people. Jesus Christ loves exhibitionists, introverts, extroverts, people who crave the limelight, people who can't stand the limelight. Jesus died for the sins of the angry, the disillusioned, the fed up, the dreamers, the idealists, those who are world weary and suicidal, bitter, cynical, depressed, full of spite. And Jesus hung on the cross to offer forgiveness to everyone. But don't you dare stand before God and say, you can't judge me. Don't you dare stand before God and say, how can you say you forgive my sin? That's not sin. That's the way I am. I was born angry. I was, you should see what happened to me. That's why I'm bitter. Jesus came to bring peace. He came to bring forgiveness to everyone. And you know what? Most people are going to miss it. Most people are going to miss it because to receive forgiveness is an admission of guilt. Do you see that? And nobody's going to judge me. Nobody's going to judge my lifestyle. Nobody's going to judge my choices. To receive, listen, to receive grace is an admission of guilt. And it feels so good to come clean, to come out in the sunlight, stop making excuses for all of it, saying, no, no, no. My culture says this isn't sin, but I know it is. Lord God, I'm trusting you. I, I'm, I'm not going to trust myself. I'm not going to trust my culture. Why would you trust your culture anyways? Culture is made up of what? People groups. People groups are made up of what? Families. Families are made up of what? People like you and I. I'm not perfect. Are you? That means my family's not perfect. It means my city's not perfect. My state's not perfect. My country's not perfect. My culture's not perfect. So culture doesn't get to define what's right and wrong. That's kind of God's job, by definition. Nobody has to miss out. I hope nobody in this room today, I hope nobody watching on television or the internet, I hope anybody who's watching this doesn't miss out. Because of Good Friday, because of Easter, the doors of heaven are wide open. You can walk in. Anybody can walk in. But people are always closing the doors in their own heart, right? I don't want God. I don't want him. I don't want him. 
I hope nobody's going to miss out. Jesus will accept anyone who will, uh, he will reject no one, but we have the power to reject him. And just like the devil, remember the devil in the Old Testament? He said, I will ascend to the throne of the Most High. You know what that meant? He says, I want to put my butt on God's throne. And when we say, I'm going to decide what's right and wrong, I'm going to let, my culture is going to tell me what's right and wrong. It's like we're putting our little tiny butts on God's big throne. And we're just like our naive ancestors. Naive, Adam and Eve. Eating the forbidden fruit, willfully believing that we're more qualified than God. That is naive. I'm more qualified by God. I'm going to tell you how I run my life. And God says, speak up. Which planet are you on again? They're all like pieces of dust, you know. Oh, yeah, the one I came to and became a human being and died on the cross for. It's so naive. And we're just like Adam and Eve eating that forbidden fruit and believe that we can be qualified <coughs> to determine what's right and what's wrong, that we can cherry pick Bible verses. I'm just going to go through and take what I like. Oh, so you don't have faith in God. You just want God to give a stamp of approval to what you already decided is right and wrong, right? Do you believe this? Uh, that was a rhetorical question, guys. No. That's, or are we going to say, no, I'll take what I like and I'm going to leave the rest because I will stand before the throne of God and I'll tell him. I'll show him. What, how can you ever grow if I only agree with the things I already agree with? There's no room for growth. I'm fine as I am. Not going to grow anymore, thank you. I've already decided, well, the Bible says this. Ooh, that's kind of convicting. I suppose I should repent, but no. Instead, I think I'll just ignore it because I don't want to grow. You know what? Non-Christians, they laugh at Christians cherry-picking the Bible the way we like to go through and just choose a few verses to harp on. Don't do that. I don't think I'm going to take this verse because that would be uncomfortable. I might have to change a few things. I might have to re repent. I might have to say, God, I'm wrong and you're right. I might have to say, boy, I really blew it. I might have to say, I can kind of go in the wrong direction for the last 10 years. And I kind of hate that. <laughs> Because I like this image of myself always being right. And so most people, most people are going to walk away from the cross where love incarnate died for them. Because we'd rather, listen, we would rather sulk in hell than admit how messed up we really are. If you're going to take that Savior's hand, you better know you're drowning. We would rather shake our fists at heaven and say, how dare you, God? You can't tell me what to do. In fact, I will judge the judge. Then accept love. Then accept mercy. He says, why are you shaking your fist at me? I love you. I'm going to defend everything. Why are you defending it? I already died for it, and I forgave you. Now just come to me. Take a hold of my hand. I want to, bring, I want to give you joy. I want to bring you peace. I want to bring you paradise. Not me. I'd rather shake my fist at God than accept love, accept grace that was bought with blood on the cross. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13, listen. He said, enter through that narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many people are on that road, Jesus said. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life. And in Jesus said, only a few find it. Foundation Bible Church. Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.